thank you very much, uh, Julian. So welcome back, everyone. Um, so just a quick reminder, what we saw yesterday was an introduction uh, to collider phenomenology. So we discussed a little bit about uh, why we collide particles. So I gave you some numbers, uh, just to give you a rough idea of like, the type of like, computational issues that we have to address uh, at the LHC. And, um, and then we kind of took a, like a almost hands-on approach. So we look at, at a process, the radian process, the production of two new proton-proton collisions. And, and we try a way to compute, to use what we know, which is per perturbative uh, field theory, so Feynman diagrams, to compute um, the cross-section for this process. And we sort of stated uh, the part of model. And then at the end of the lecture yesterday, we discussed a little bit how to make sense of these singularities that appear at the uh, Z-pole. And so we introduced the concept of a decay particle. And through the optical theorem, we, we essentially be able, we, we were able to write down what is known as the Breidigner uh, expression. And in particular, we look at the narrow width approximation. So what we want to do today um, is to instead talk about the other uh, part of the title of this lecture course, which is quantum chromodynamics. So the subject, subject is vast, so really uh, I'll try to do my best to make it like concise, but at the same time comprehensible. But if you have questions either during the lecture or later today, uh, please don't be shy. So the plan for today is to give a, a review of QCD and I essentially will follow a almost historical path. So try to see what, are, what were the hints uh, uh, that led us people to write down a, a, theory, a, a field theory for a strong interactions. And then again, we'll come back to, the, uh, to our uh, uh, process and we'll try to uh, use this understanding of, of, of QCD to compute what are known as radiative correction to the gradient process. So we'll try to uh, compute the cross-section uh, to order alpha s. Yes, we did to order alpha s to zero. Then if, if I have time, and I don't think I will have today, but that's not a big problem because we can talk about it tomorrow, uh, I will discuss the uh, important equations in QCD, which, is called, uh, which are called uh, Dr. Sir Griebel, uh, the part of alter and the image. Okay. And, uh, and again, uh, in the same spirit as, as yesterday, uh, um, I won't do you know complete calculation, but I'll try to sketch uh, sketch it for like what are the <coughs> essential points. So, first thing we want to say today is to discuss a little bit QCD, and uh, we're going to do this from an historical perspective. So if we go back in time, um, I guess we can say that the, the quest for uh, understanding, try and understand strong interaction started in the sort of late 1930s, or we'll say in the 1930s. Um, well, no. I mean, late 1930s, I guess people were worried about the world. So I said, let's say in the 30s. And uh, what is for me the starting point well, is the realization um, that the proton, sorry, that the nucleon, the nuclei are not elementary particles. So, you know, people for, for a long time had this picture of like uh, a positively charged nu a nucleus as the core of an atom with electrons that are gravitating uh, around it. Um, but this sort of like surprise came when we realized that the nucleus actually. Uh, uh, it's not an elementary particle, but we have nucleons, so protons, which are positively charged, and neutrons. So, the, and immediately one, you know, needs to, yeah, this comes as a bit of a surprise because we all know, sorry, that's a bad neutrons. We don't have electrons in it. Um, uh, this was, uh, I, you know, I, I wasn't there. In the 30s, but I guess this came as, as a surprise because you know we all know that positive, positively charged particles tend to repel each other. So what on earth is binding them together into to form a uh, nuclear? And uh, this has to be a rather strong force, hence the name, because it needs to win 
the uh, electromagnetic, the, co uh, the Coulomb propulsion between the positive and charged particles. But also, we really don't have any experience of this force as scales which are bigger than the, the nuclei. So we, you know, this, this, this strong force doesn't really affect chemistry, doesn't really affect atomic physics. So it has to be something with a very short um, uh, range of action. So roughly the size of the nucleus, so short range force. Roughly one phantom. So how do you achieve that? Well, we all know the electromagnetism is a long range interaction. The reason you can state the same fact by saying the photon, the carrier of this, of this force is massless. Um, and so if you want to build a, uh, a form, if you want to build a, a force which has a short range, what you can do is to uh, postulate a massive uh, force carrier. And, and historically, the way this was achieved was, was through some which is called the Yukawa model. Which is, a, I guess, it's mid 30s. So, in this model, um, uh, the nucleons, so the proton and the neutron, they live in a doublet, but that's not essential for our discussion at the moment. Uh, but, well, actually, it is important for what will come later. So, they, you know, putting an isospin uh, doublet. And they interact through the change of a massive particles, the Yukawa called the pion. And because the pion is massive, then the force field, the resulting force is short range. I think Sasha also touched upon this um, early today. Uh, and people were happy because actually, um, you know, they started doing experiments and they discovered the pion. Actually, they discovered the pion twice because the first time the pion was discovered, it actually wasn't the pion, but it was the mu. Then eventually the actual pion, uh, well, the actual pions were discovered. And so this seemed to fit uh, rather nicely. Uh, so the theory, simple theory of Yukawa seemed to explain, uh, well, describe strong force rather. And as often happens, um, our experimental colleagues, they don't sit on their hands and, and they try to do better and better experiments. And really, and this is an example where the uh, improvement in the experimental techniques, experimental reads, reaches, and precision led to a revolution. And so really, the experiments that came essentially after the war um, really lead really to a complete new uh, uh, range of phenomena that needed an expansion. So we can say it really was a better experiment led to a revolution. And uh, what are, or at least for me, the two main points of this revolution? What, like, what were the things that we couldn't explain um, uh, with the Yukawa uh, model? Well, we start doing experiments, we pump up the energy and we produce more and more hadronic states. Okay, so high energy means more hadronic states. Leading to what people, well, you can find in some books, this, uh, uh, this expression, the particles Okay, so before this type of experiment, I said, okay, the, there's a proton, there's the neutron, and there are these pions. Look, we discovered them, that's it. Um, but now we, we start producing other, uh, other uh, adronic states. So either mesons, like the rho mesons, the kaons, or other baryons, the lambda baryons, the delta uh, baryons, and so on and so forth. And really look like the zoo with, like, you know, you, you increase it with the energy, and new particles appear. What is the relation? Uh, you know, can we describe, can we find a way of describing this, uh, this part, these new particles? Is there, uh, I mean, some of them, they look like a heavier copy of the, of the proton, some other different uh, spin or quantum numbers. 
uh, can we find an organizing principle? So that's one set of experiments, sort of like uh, we can we can call them spectroscopy, like for that, the new states. The other ones are uh, electron proton experiments. So very high energetic, well, very energy for the time. Uh, now we call them low energy experiment, EP scattering. And why we, we do that, we would mention we mentioned this in the first lecture. Um, if you use a, a, um, a probe, which we consider point like something that we know a lot about, the electron, we can try and, and see uh, and study uh, what the proton looks like. And, and so the, the type of experiments that were made are uh, well, essentially you have a target. Uh, with atoms, which are essentially our protons, and, and you shine on them a beam on, uh, of electrons. And what happens is that you can follow, like you know the, the, the kinematics of the incoming electron, and you can measure the kinematics of the outgoing energy. And by reconstructing this scattering angular energy, you're able to, um, in, you know, to probe uh, the structure of the proton. How do you do that? For instance, you have, it's not a Feynman diagram, you have an electron incoming, you have an electron, say, with some full momentum P1, and one outgoing with some momentum P3. Let's keep it consistent with the notes. And so the trans momentum to the momentum which is transferred to the proton is Q, which, uh, which is nothing else than P1, P3. And so one. Now, the um, if you look then at Q square, this is a time-like um, vector. Okay, so this one another difference with respect to Sasha's lectures. For me, uh, my metric is mostly minus, and so Q square is equal to m square, not minus m square. So just to you know keep keep you on your toes so you don't, uh, you don't you have to pay attention to all the mindset so this is in my notation now this is because q is time like q square is negative so q square is equal to p1 minus p3 square which is negative and so we introduce typically is introduce a capital q square which is minus q square that's standard in the analysis in, in this type of experiments and also the other variable which is often introduced is q square divided by 2p1.q. You can see, and this is called Bjorken x, Bjorken bar. And you see that all the kinematics is expressed. You, know, you can resolve all the kinematics by just looking at the outgoing, um, incoming and outgoing electrons. We really don't measure anything about the proton in these experiments. OK, so what happens? Um, we can do a you know, hand wavy argument, say that uh, if we can associate a um, wavelength to the this virtual photon, which roughly would go as one of the square root of Q squared. So the higher the uh, momentum transfer, the smaller the uh, the wavelength wavelength of the photon uh, is going to be, and so we can probe deeper and deeper into the um, into the proton. So if we have uh, a uh, lambda which is roughly, it's comparable to the radius of the proton. But what we're going to see in our experiment is essentially that the proton appears as a point-like part, particle. But then if we pump up uh, our momentum transfer, and so we are able to reach lambda, which is much smaller than the radius of the proton, all of a sudden we can resolve the fact that the proton is not uh, sorry, I said that these were not Feynman diagrams, so we're not the targets. Uh, we are able to resolve the inner structure of the, of the proton. And what are the outcomes of these experiments? So in, in these type of experiments, but where, the, where lambda is much less than the proton, uh, the proton radius, 
it means that Q squared is much larger than the mass square of the proton. And these experiments are called deep and elastic scattering experiments because really what we do is that we destroy the proton. So the, the, you know, the, the, the final state, uh, in the final states, we don't really have a proton. We have a bunch of atoms that we don't really uh, reconstruct. So um, what are the two atoms? So here you have to bear in mind because they're a little bit less uh, well, easy to, to discuss. So the one thing I have to tell you, and here you really have to believe me, is that on very general ground, we can um, parameterize the double differential cross section in X and, uh, uh, and Q squared in terms of two structure functions. These are essentially, so if you do elastic scattering, these are related to the uh, charge and magnetic form factor of the proton. Maybe you heard about this in your introductory nuclear part of physics. But anyway, in, in sort of like in relativistic uh, description of the phenomenon, you usually introduce two structure functions, which you call F1 and F2, with the physicists that like uh, a lot of imagination. So, uh, and, and these structure functions, F1 and F2, are the ones that we are uh, interested in because they are sort of like, they contain the information we want to understand. They contain information about the proton. So the first thing people notice is that if they plot it, so the structure function f1 and f2, they are function of x and q squared in on very general graph. And so they they looked at them, and what they discover is that if they really look at the data, they see that the data, say for f2, they appear to be rather independent of q squared. So this Q square is sort of like in GV is two, four, okay. Uh, so this phenomenon is called your can scale. So F2, which is in principle a function of X and Q square, experimentally appears to be only a function of X. Second fact, experimental fact, as I said, these, this first part is driven by experimental, experimental results. <clears throat> Instead, plot the structural function, now it's interesting to plot them as a function of x because they don't depend on q square, but you don't plot f, so if you plot f1 and f2 separately, they depend on x. But if you plot this combination, 2x f1 divided by f2, Well, the data, a low x, they show dependence, but then, sorry, these are meant to be data point. So maybe a low x, there is some dependence, but once you reach certain value of x, let's say 0 0.2, 0 0.3, you reach a plateau. So you reach this, I guess, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, up to 1. Um, so to, to a very good approximation, there's a relation between 2x f1 and f2, in particular, f2 is equal to 2x f1. And these are called, they have a name, they're called Cullen Gross relation. States that f2 is 2x f1. Okay, so these are the facts. We produce many state, many adronic states. So we don't have, we don't have just protons, neutrons, and pions, but we have many adronic states. And if we do uh, a high energy experiments where we probe the electron with a, with a, uh, uh, probe the proton with a, with an electron, we found the point Bjorken scale in color cross range. So. Okay, you need uh, uh, you need clever people to uh, try to find models that are able to uh, describe uh, this phenomenon. And um, and at the beginning, these were really taken as very different regime, and so it's not surprising to see that the people came up with two different models to explain each of these uh, features. And so the 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 model, the organizing principle uh, to sort of classify uh, all these messy atomic state. Uh, is I'm sure you know is due by was sort of by discovered by uh, Gelman and is known as the Quark model. So what 
uh, Gelman theorized is really uh, is a way essentially by using group theory to organize, uh, recognize that the all this hadronic state can be classified in terms of representation of a, of a, of a symmetry group. And the symmetry group, um, in order to build the symmetry group, he needed, Gelman needed to introduce uh, fundamental building blocks. Uh, upon which he was able to combine them according to the representation. And to these building blocks, he gave the, the name quarks. And so in the sort of simplest version, you have three quarks. Well, in the simplest version, you have only two quarks. In the simplest, but more interesting version, you have three quarks, uh, which I call U, S, and D. And, and they are, uh, are triplets of a flavor symmetry. So it's a symmetry that uh, allows to rotate your DNS and if you construct the representation of SU3, uh, you'll find the, the famous eightfold way. So you find a way of, of uh, um, build uh, wave function, well, understand and build the wave functions for the mesons and the variants. And then you can go on, you can also ask yourself what happens if I put the charm fork in it, and then you have to build the representation of SU4 and so on and so forth. <coughs> um, a very interesting point of the quark model is uh, has to do, I'm sure I probably know this story, uh, um, how to solve the problem of the uh, delta baryon. So the delta baryon, um, you know, entered this classification by the problem, uh, there was a problem about the, the fact that S of, of the symmetry, uh, anti-symmetry rather, of, of the wave function. So in order to accommodate in this model the delta plus plus, a new degrees of freedom had to be introduce a new quantum number, actually. And this quantum number uh, was called color. And you know, in this way, if you think of a new quantum number, you can anti-symmetrize or symmetrize the, the wave function according to this uh, new quantum number, and you get a wave function, total wave function that respects the symmetry uh, you want to have for, for fermions. Okay? So in, in, in this model, the, the color is almost an next, next Okay, so that if you want, um, we people were quite happy about spectroscopy, about the low energy uh, regime of uh, adronic interaction, because we are able at least to classify uh, strongly interacting states. Even more interesting for, uh, for what we're going to say uh, today is the, um, the model that allowed us to understand deep energy structure. And this we discussed briefly yesterday is the pattern. Yeah, I just tried to. Okay. Okay, what does the, the pattern model say? Well, um, we can, <coughs> the pattern model states that we can describe the inelastic electron proton cross section, D sigma electron proton, and I remind you this is deeply inelastic, as the product of two things an elastic partonic cross section, so the cross section between the electron and a parton, which I leave like uh, unspecified at the end which carries a momentum fraction z of the momentum of the proton times the probability f to find this parton into the proton carried z fraction of the momentum. So these partons have fractional electric charge and they are, they have two features. One, they are almost, well, essentially free They do interact with the, the photon, but they, they are, we can treat them as, as free. And two, their spin is one and a half. Now, if you do the calculation, and I, <coughs> but it's a, it's a very interesting exercise for the part of the deep elastic, you see that the consequence of, of this first assumption is the Yorkian scale. And you see this already in the 
um, in the formula because you see that the the the, um, the structural function will be related to this probability distributions f, and this f naturally don't depend on q square, or at least in the problem. Well, I guess so. Here, then you should sum the whole possible type. Now, said spin a half, there was a question yesterday. In the pattern model, really, in the pattern model for uh, deep elastic, and it's the same for trivial, you are the spin a half patterns that interact. And, uh, and this was necessary to explain uh, the common gross relation. So if we were to, you know, instead, uh, postulate that the, the, the patterns in the proton that interact with the uh, uh, with gamma star, with the offshore photons, are spin zero parts. Well, then you will find the game Bjorken scaling, but you will find that F1 and F2 are not related to each other by the common uh, relations. Okay, so you'll find a different range. So really, <clears throat> this pointed us that at least in deep analysis scattering, the, the interaction, the partonic interaction is between the electron and the spin and a half parton, uh, and this interaction is mediated by this off shell. So that's very good because we are now starting to build a more complete picture of strong interaction. So we can say. the following things. So strong interaction at high energy. So if you want to compute, if you want to describe strong interaction at uh, a very high energy, well, the, the, the hadrons or the baryons, uh, they behave as are almost a collection of Three partners. Instead, a low energy, high and low mean, means the so a hadron is a high energy if the typical energy of the process is much bigger than the mass, of the rest mass of the stuff. Um, <clears throat> well, a low energy, the, 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 the hadrons are bound states. States um, with symmetry property, which are dictated by the core constituents in the model. Okay, so this U, D, and S that Gamma introduced to uh, realize at the SU3 uh, symmetry. And now, we, so we are happy on the one hand because we have models of this parameter. On the other hand, we're not very satisfied because we have two models and we believe the uh, strong interactions are. Uh, should be one and the same in the two models. And so the, the next question we would like to ask ourselves is like, can we build a theory that um, of strong interaction that is able to describe both models and in some sense contains both models, the quark model and the pattern model in the appropriate uh, kinematic limits. And so, you know, remember we, we, are, this is, we are in the 1940s, 1950s, more people knew. Well, people knew QED. People knew that quantum field theory combined with gauge symmetry uh, allow us to describe one of the most, you know, gave us one of the most beautiful theory uh, that we, you know, quantum electrodynamics. Beautiful and very precise. And so the natural question, um, a natural question, it's always say, it's always easy to say natural question once you know the answer, but I say a natural question could be, can we, can we build a theory, uh, a field theory or strong interaction using engaged principle. <clears throat> so in in QED, I remind you what are, what is the the gauge group of QED and what does it mean gauge symmetry? Well, there's many ways of um, stating that, but one way of saying is that the uh, to notice that the, the classical QED Lagrangian, oh, actually the classical um, Dirac Lagrangian enjoys the U1 symmetry. So we can uh, rotate our spinners by effects. And uh, we can gauge the symmetry, so to say, uh, 
uh, by promoting, by requiring that the symmetry of the, the phase is a log, is local. So by giving the phase a uh, dependence on uh, space time event, space time coordinates. Now, yeah, I'm not going to go through the calculation, but you all know that if you do this to the Dirac equation, you find that the new local symmetry is not, the local transformation is not a symmetry, uh, essentially because the now the derivative uh, doesn't commute uh, with the with this transformation, and so you need to add to your theory uh, another diffusive freedom, maybe the, the photon field, the gauge field, with appropriate transformation properties that is able to be absorbed this uh, this um, uh, this extra term. Sorry, I'm going fast, assuming that you all know this, but if you don't, then we can come back to this in the, the discussion. So now, what, would, what are we going to do for QCD? Well, one could try a different, um, uh, a different gauge. And in particular, well, I guess one can try different things, but let's go down to, the, um, to what we actually is the answer that we accept now. <coughs> um, well, in the same spirit, remember before we had, we start with a, a global symmetry of the free Lagrangian and we make it local. Now, if we want to start with the, with the global symmetry of the Lagrangian, we have to find a, a quantum number that we haven't used yet. And, and this is in one of the ways that the, the, the quark model helps us. Because in the quark model, remember, we had to insert by hand a new quantum number, color. Um, and so, you know, a, a, a good, a, the good try would be is okay, let's try to take this quantum number and the symmetry related to them and promote these to be our gauge symmetry. And so the gauge group of QCD the SC is SUNC, where NC is the number of color. And now you get a non abelian gauge symmetry. And so our quark field, sorry, our fermionic field, we haven't, I guess we can now say that we, you know, since we, we, we talk about number of color three, then these fermions are quarks, or are quarks, um, transform. Okay. Then, um, okay, that one can go on and write down the classical QCD Lagrangian. Um, so, where we have the term which is related to, so equivalent in the same way that we had to introduce a photon field, here we have introduced a, another gauge field, field which is the one field. And then, yeah, um, your Dirac Lagrangian. What is the best way of writing it's Writing this way, then I'll specify. Yeah, delta J. So I, I introduced some indices, so let me tell you what they are. Um, I and J. Coherent with what I've written before. These are uh, indices of the gauge group that live in the fundamental representation. So this is the representation upon which the fermion field transform. And so they go from one to and C to three. A, okay, here I don't we don't have time to go in through the, the derivation of this, but essentially this um, you have to introduce one gluon field. For each uh, generator of the of, of the gauge group, so for the photon, U one is only one generator, so you do only one photon here. Uh, you have to introduce uh, a gluon field for each generator of S U n, and so A goes from one to n c square minus one, which is the number of generators. So for Q C D, where n c is equal to three. This eight, so you have eight groups. 
And I'll try to keep this notation, although sometimes I'll, I'll fail, that I and J are in, this, in, in the fundamental representation, and I and J and A will be uh, in, this, in the adjoint. I also put a mass term for the quarks, although um, very often we're going to consider them masses. And you see that the mass term is diagonal in color, why the covariant derivative depends on, uh, on color, you know, the, in a way which I'll specify in a second. Now, uh, there's one thing left to write on this is that uh, remember, according to the quark model, you don't have only one flavor of quark, but you can have u quark, d quarks. Strange charm, and so on and so forth. So here you have to sum the flavor. The QCD interactions are completely blind. Okay, so the only thing I need to tell you now is what are this D and this G. I'll do this in a second. So this is the covariant derivative um, in. Uh, J minus I G S A mu, and this will look like this is what the covariant derivative in Q D would look like. And now you also have the generators. Let's see the draw. And also the field strand has a similar structure. This Q E D is called F mu nu. So the same structure. But then, you also have this uh, further contribution, which comes from the structure function of the group. Okay, um, so this is the classical Lagrangian, and, uh, and if this were a course on uh, lectures on quantization of uh, monopoly in H theory, then we'll have to you know, work hard to uh, actually do this quantization. Now, this is a very non trivial task, but is well understood. So we know how to quantize monopoly in H theory. We know there are complications. We have uh, Fade proposal. Uh, ghosts, uh, but you also have symmetries that have uh, BRS symmetry and so on. So we're not going to spend any time uh, discussing uh, how to um, uh, quantize this theory, but we're just going to, you know, say that it is possible, uh, although very non-trivial, to uh, to quantize it, to to get a, a to really go from a Lagrangian which describes. Uh, uh, Quarks and gluon fields to uh, the quantum field theory version. Um, so if you do that, then we can really talk about like associate particles to, to fields and uh, uh, and build a consistent field theory. And in this field theory, what we have is that we have quark fields that we say transform in the fundamental representation of the color group, and anti-quarks field that transform in the the three bar representation. <clears throat> and sometimes if you read like uh, Fino books, you say, they say that uh, quarks have three colors. Uh, like in the same way, um, the gluons transform in the adjoint representation. And, and the dimension of the adjoint representation, which is a real representation, is eight. And that's why sometimes people say that the gluons have eight different colors. I don't really like the, this way of thinking. I mean, this, these are fields that they transform according to some rules. What is the most important difference compared, well, one of the biggest differences compared to QED <clears throat> is that in QCD, the gauge boson also carry uh, the, the group charge. And, and this is reflected um, into the final rules that you obtain once you quantize the. So, Again, we can do that. You can derive final, you can quantize the, the Lagrange to derive the final rules. And, and what you find, let me write them, some of them are here for you, is that unsurprisingly, essentially from uh, the covariant derivative, when the covariant derivative 
is sandwiched between uh, the field psi and psi bar, you this generator vertex which couples together the fermions and the uh, and the gluon. And this very much looks very much like the, the coupling that you also have in, um, in QED. Gamma mu. With the difference here, there you have also a generator of the group sitting here. However, if you look at the terms, particularly if you look at the field strength term, G mu nu, G mu, and you expand it out, you see that you get a new contribution because you can have crosstalks between what well, you'll have the mm, uh, connected terms for the, the gluon field A, but you also have crosstalks between F, A, B, C, and the derivatives, or two terms which contains two uh, F, A, B, Cs. <clears throat> so in QCD, you also have vertices which couples together three gluons. These are absent in QT, but even four. And these really appear by expanding out uh, the, the, the G menu, G menu. Uh, there are other final rules that you get, the one involving ghosts. And, Uh, okay, and all the propagators and so on and so forth. Okay, so at this point, um, we, have, uh, uh, we have a theory um, that in some sense we assume to be perturbed. So we have, we have a field theory that we, um, for which we can develop a perturbative theory, uh, treatment. So you know, we write down a uh, correlation function, we, we do our usual LZ, and we derive finding rules. And so we, we have a theory with which we can calculate things. Now, whether this theory has anything to do with reality, with nature, with the strong interaction, at this point, is, is just an act of faith. There's nothing at the moment that tells us that this theory, this gate perturbative theory, should be able to describe strong interaction. Um, but okay, let's uh, let's press on and, and let's see why we think that this is the case. <clears throat> so if you have a, a perturbative field theory, the first thing you can do, you, you can start computing scattering amplitudes. And, uh, and if you feel brave enough, you can also compute one loop correction. Uh, you can start with one correction to the correlation function, then you can build the scattering amplitudes up to that. And if you've done, I guess all of you have done a course on the quantum field theory, you'll find um, ultraviolet divergences. So when you compute loop diagrams, you'll find that your theory uh, contains some infinities that you need to regularize and somehow deal with. And uh, in this respect, QCD is not different compared to any other theory. And so you'll have, uh, you'll have to introduce a renormalization constant. Typically, these are called the ones, the two, the three, then the one related to the mass, and maybe something related to the uh, edge fixing. Anyway, you have some renormalization constant that you can use um, fixing a scheme to reabsorb your singularities. Note, for instance, that this is another difference with respect to QED. Note in QED, there are relations between, there are easy relations between this uh, renormalization constant. So, for instance, if you call so one is the two, the renormalization constant <coughs> of the vertex and the, uh, and the fermion, uh, because of the word identities in QED, you find that Z1 is equal to Z2. Um, and so this makes things a little bit easier. Now, this doesn't hold in QCD because the equivalent of the word Takashi identities are a bit more complicated and, and they don't allow us to compute their identities. Um, so, okay, let's assume that we, we do this type of calculation and what, gonna, what are we find, what we're gonna find is something that I'm just gonna state as a fact. 
Um, and the fact is the following. So when you renormalize the coupling, uh, so when you use this, uh, this constant to renormalize the coupling, the outcome of this procedure is, can be phrased in the terms of a renormalized coupling, alpha s equals g square for pi. And this coupling um, acquires a dependence on a mass scale, on an energy scale. Now you can see this in many different, in many different ways. You can see this in terms of uh, a, um, Renormalizing the theory at a particular point in a, at a particular energy scale, or you can see this as a result of the fact that in dimensional regularization you have to do some mass if you go away from the dimension. Now, this is not a lecture on renormalization groups, so I'm going to state these facts here. Uh, and the fact is that you can write down an equation um, that tells you, gives you information about the dependence of the coupling the effective coupling alpha on this energy scale. And to lowest order, the famous equation is the following. The logarithmic derivative of the coupling, the effective coupling alpha s, can be written as minus beta naught, which is a coefficient calculable in perturbation theory, times alpha s squared. And, okay, I'm, stating this as a fact. Now this B0, as I told you, can be calculated and in QCD as a famous result. It's 11 CA, CA is equal to the number of columns, so QCD is equal to three, and NF is the number of uh, masses for fermions divided by 12. Why do I say that this is a famous calculation? Because this is a calculation for which uh, Gross, Politz, and Wilczek uh, got the Nobel Prize for 2004. <clears throat> okay, so if we have this equation and we know beta naught, we can try and solve this equation to find what is the function alpha s of the square. Okay, that's a simple enough calculation we can even I can attempt to do on the fly. So let's uh, look at these and let's separate the variables. The old physicist, we can do this. So d alpha, alpha square is equal to d mu square, mu square with coefficient minus beta. Okay, now I integrate this guy. Let me call this now, I consider alpha an integration variable. So let me call it just alpha. And I integrate those sides of the equation. Um, let me integrate from a starting scale, which I can take as the z pole. Any mass will do. So, uh, the starting scale can be taken wherever you want. And a final scale, which I can't use q squared. Okay, so. Integral is not difficult to do. What you get is one over alpha s of mz square. It's <coughs> me, one minus alpha s u square is equal to minus beta naught log square. The reason why we pick mz is because the most precise determination, well, um, it's an arbitrary convention. Let run at the z pole, uh, and so usually we give the values of alpha s at that at that at that point. So that's an arbitrary but very common choice. Now we can all, I guess we can solve these and write the alpha s at the scale q square you want is alpha s at the a year reference scale, say m z, one over alpha s to zero log q square over and that's what. Now, what is the 
and we plot this function as a function of Q-square. Mm -hmm. uh, here I have mz. I told you that I pick as a reference scale because I know alpha s at mz. So alpha s at mz is equal to 0 0.118. And then I can plot this function. Okay. And so first of all, let's notice that is a decreasing function of the scale because beta naught is positive in QCD, so minus beta naught is negative. Um, NF is uh, well, number of masses it really depends on the scale, but let's say we have, if we have four uh, or even five um, massless uh, fermions, you uh, 33 minus uh, 10 is the most. Okay. So it's the decreasing function of the scale. There's a pole. And the pole is the zero of the denominator. We call it lambda C. Okay, so this is the sort of like this is the result that allow us to establish that QCD was a good candidate for uh, describing strong interaction. Why do I say so? Well, you see. That my coupling, my effective coupling, so what measures the, the, the strength of interaction is really a function of the scale. And I can see that if the scale involved in the process Q squared, you can think of that as the transfer moment, uh, the moment which is transfer, is large, large meaning you know, much larger than lambda QCD. So in this region, so in this region here. Then uh, here, alpha s is small. And so I can use two things. So I can talk about, I can use perturbation theory. And I can, so I can talk about quarks and gluons. As instead I go instead I go in the infrared, you see the coupling grows. And here alpha s alpha s one. So perturbation theory in alpha s doesn't make sense. This means that I, when Q square is of the order lambda QCD, I cannot talk about quotes and goals. But I have to talk about hardness. QCD confines, maybe, uh, or anyway, it doesn't need a perturbative description. And so quotes and goals are not the right degrees of freedom that I should be using. I need other things. I can do, for instance, try to solve the, the theory non perturbative theory, that is QCD. Or I can use symmetry of the Lagrange, like current perturbation theory, uh, to be able to say so. Um, but it's very clear that they you know two different regimes of matches. One where I can talk about quotes and gluons, another regime where I cannot talk about quotes and gluons. I have to talk about hadrons. Um, very last thing, maybe before uh, the break, you see here there's a, I, I indicate a lambda QCD. What is lambda QCD? Is the, is the zero of the denominator of the perturbative cup. So at this value, um, at the value of the QCD equals mz. Beta zero. At this value, the, the, the perturbative coupling goes up. Of course, like before we reach that value, the perturbative description is not valid any longer. And so it doesn't really make sense to talk about a, this type of similarity. But still, nevertheless, we say that you know QCD is a Landau pole in the in the infrared. But really, we should be stop talking, we can't talk about quotes and gluons way before we reach.
Okay. Um, maybe Juliano, if I can take another five minutes and then we do the break later, there's maybe one, one more thing I wanted to say. Is that okay for everyone? I'll take it as a yes. So for, for this feature, which is called asymptotic freedom, by the way, um, we think that QCD is able in principle um, to generalize both the quark model and the particle model. So it's a theory that at low energy predicts bound states of atoms that can be organized according to the quark model. And the very high energy instead uh, is a theory which is almost free. It is almost free. And so the pattern model uh, makes sense. So let's go back for a second to our picture of proton-proton collisions. And that's where I want to leave you before the break. So if you remember, we, had, we said that we had some proton, two protons coming in. And protons leave, at, uh, the mass of the proton is clearly of order lambda C. So the internal dynamic of the protons is non-perturbative. I'd, I'd rather agree. And now, you know, we, are, we can have some radiation uh, from the proton. But then at some point, we know, or we think, that we can have a hard scattering, which can be described, described in terms of quarks and gluons. And so I write it in red. And this hard scattering will produce our muon pair. Plus or minus. But also, you know, since we are doing QCD, we can also produce other quarks and gluons. So in red, I have the hard interaction. So for instance, if I produce a Z boson of the environment mass, it should be much larger than the QCD square. Now you see that eventually, <clears throat> okay, my mu plus mu minus, I, I, I measure it. And then what happens to the QCD radiation that can accompany this, this process? Well, uh, you have subsequent splitting. And so what happens is that the, end, the typical energy scale uh, drops as you split and split and split. And so at some point, you go back to a non perturbative regime where, again, you cannot talk about quarks and gluons, but you reach a scale where you form pions, kaons, maybe again protons, pion, kaons, and so on and so forth. And these all have a mass scale of the order of the QCD. And you see now that some kind of pictures start to emerge. We start with protons, which are non perturbative objects. Then, and somehow, if you're interested in high energy scattering, then there the will be a transition um, at some scale above which I can talk about, I can use perturbative language to describe the scattering of quarks and gluons. So I, I can do so and can I compute the, the stuff which is in, in this picture is in red using perturbation theory. But then <clears throat> I have to realize that you know, even if I produce quarks and gluons, they will split and split and split and lower their energy. And eventually, they will go back to, into a regime where perturbation theory no longer applies and where they, they will recombine to form bound states. And this is the bound states that we're going to measure in our detector, pines, kaons, and so on. And so if you wanted to write this picture in uh, in formula, the cross section for u plus u minus. Now can be written as z one, z two, zero, zero, one. At i, z one, j, z two. A tiny sigma, j, u minus plus anything else. And this will be a function of tau, this will see. Now, we know that we have to do, if we imagine to compute this 
red blob a, a higher loops, you have to introduce a renormalization scale. And what this pink line that I drew, and this will be so but this will be the, what we're going to end up in, in an hour, maybe more. We we'll also need to sort of specify another scale, which is universally called the factorization scale, which allows allows me to separate what I consider perturbative from what I consider non perturbative. And finally, as one of your colleagues said yesterday, I have to sum of all possible states, atomic states that I find. Okay, so I think this is a good place to stop. Uh, so you can stare at this, this formula and try to, uh, to think about uh, what it means. And, and we'll, we'll start from here and, and the, the, the target, uh, what well, is the target we, the thing we're gonna do are two essentially. One, we want to understand uh, how to compute sigma hat. And we want to make sense of this new scale Okay. I guess I'll stop here for the break, and uh, maybe we. Sorry, maybe I'll start from here because I guess I went a little bit fast on this. So, uh, I guess what we are building is at the moment an intuitive picture of uh, uh, how we model uh, using QCD uh, collisions at the edge, and so we. Um, we recognize that we start with uh, protons. Actually, we give a name to this object that we use to model the protons uh, in high edge collision by copying the edge. And everything in green on this picture stands to, like, it's trying to represent some QCD in a regime where uh, it's a, a low energy, so where we cannot talk about books and things. And so we have to talk about protons in the initial state, and the blob, green blobs in the final state are, again, bound states, uh, so hadrons. And anything is right instead is things that we can hope to describe in perturbation theory, because they are characterized, characterized by energy scales much larger than the QCD. And, uh, and I, wrote, I wrote down this formula, um, uh, which is sort of like a uh, improved version of the pattern. And so uh, in what ways improved, you see that now sigma hat is computed to uh, it's not just computed to first order to zero order in alpha s, but actually, I should write down, depends on alpha s. So it's computed to higher orders. And if, if I do that, then I need to renormalize the theory. So that's why I introduced this new R dependence. And then I have to tell you where like, I separate things in, especially, well, it's not clear why I, I need to specify this only in the initial state um, at the moment, but I need to do so. You know, so I need to introduce a new F uh, scale. It's crucial that here I wrote plus X. So I'm fully inclusive of, of the, all the QCD radiation in the final state. That's the reason why you don't need any wire for the final state, essentially. Um, following what uh, one of your colleagues said yesterday, I, I need to sum over all I's and J. And this can be quarks, but can also be gluons. In the and finally, let me tell you what is the you know, so this is, I wrote an equal sign, but this is clearly not an equal sign. And what we can hope and actually can show is that the mistake we make by writing down this formula, this factorization formula, is of the order, at least for very inclusive observable, lambda QCD square over Q square. So if you look at very high, and the process at very high Q square, then this formula becomes more and more accurate. So in, in essence, this is this. This picture and this formula that I wrote down are um, what is known as the collinear factorization, collinear factorization theorem. I have no idea why it's called collinear at, the, at this point, but we'll see this later. But let's call it just the factorization. And uh, in this form, it was derived, I guess, for the first time by three gentlemen, which are Collins, Soper, and Sturman. Factorization because it allows us to separate the perturbative part, which we can calculate using perturbative QCD, 
from the initial state, uh, which are non perturbative but described by the, uh, this part of the distribution. Now, in this very inclusive form, remember we are summing over all possible to the final state. <clears throat> this theorem, I would say, is rather robust. And it's been uh, the proof that we have of the factorization theorem is uh, almost as solid as the, well, this, I guess, is the matter of taste, as the one that we have for DAS. Now, for DAS, you can either use this type of technique, so you can use the operator product expansion to prove factorization. So, if you're curious, you can look up uh, <clears throat> many books, for instance. In chapter 32 of Matthew's first book, there is a, a, a discussion about DOP applied to uh, deep analysis capture. Uh, now, if you have you know, this type of process where you have two problems in each state, it's not quite obvious how to apply DOP, but you can use other arguments like the, the ones by Collins over Sermon to prove factorization. Now, <clears throat> what is the issue with that? Is that, well, what is the one, one open question? It's like, well, can I take this formula usually is then taken? Proven for inclusive radian and then taken essentially for almost every process of the LSC. And can, can you always do that? But, well, that's a, uh, a question that uh, uh, sometimes is difficult to answer. Well, actually, it's very it's known that this factorization theory fades if you ask questions which are too exclu very exclusive or if you have many uh, more complicated processes. So there are limitations. So it's not always true that you can write down a, 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 a drawing cross section as the convolution of part, part of this function and platonic cross section. And the mistake you're making are power corrections in number to zero to square. This is true for very implicit observables, becomes less true or false uh, if you consider more complicated processes. Okay, any other question? Okay, <clears throat> okay, I, tell, I told you that we want to do two things. One, which will turn out to be related. One is to try and compute sigma hat by order alpha. We did it for alpha s or alpha z. Two, what the hell? So by what the hell? What is new F? Okay, so these are the two things I will try to do. I'll start today, I'll probably finish tomorrow. Or tonight, yeah. Um, let's start with the first thing. We want to compute the Dragon process or the artifacts. Um, okay. Let us remind ourselves what, was, what is the platonic process we're interested in. So we saw that at leading order, we had Q cube. Let's make things simple. We are, let's, let's imagine that we have a theory where there's only, we only have one flavor of work, so we don't have to sum of the U, D, L. So there's just a work. Q cube bar to Z or gamma, that's absolutely the case, into plus or minus. And for simplicity, and also because it is a good approximation if we work near and Z, we wanna, we're gonna work in the narrow width approximation, which means that we can only, we can concentrate on the on shell production of a Z box. Just to, you know, make it a little bit. And now we try to, uh, you know, use the machinery of uh, perturbative field theory. Okay, um, final matter. So this is the process. And we want to, you know, I don't know what, what is your, you know, your favorite way of thinking about this. Are you more a person that uh, likes to draw Feynman diagrams or you like more to think about the, uh, the big contraction of your uh, fields in the uh, interaction picture? Whatever you prefer, the outcome is always the same. So the, the leading order, that's the diagram that we already calculated. We only have one P1, P2 to give us Q. Now, okay, let's, perturbation theory tells us that we have to compute. So actually, if you think about the S, kind of S matrix approach, 
We fix the initial state, we fix the final state, and we compute correction. Okay, so if we do so, then the correction that we have to compute are the loops. P1, P2, Q, and we can draw this. Now, I'll write it and then I'll discuss it. Maybe uh, I have to do this. And uh, you know, someone told you the loops can be divergent in the ultraviolet. And so you, you have to build what is known as renormalized perturbation theory. So you have to add counter terms. In a disorder, I think you need this counter term. And maybe you need this counter term as well. So let me discuss briefly. Let me open like uh, let me do an aside about these terms here. These are always, or at least for me, source confusion. So do we need to calculate these contributions? Well, to put it briefly, I mean this could be a very long discussion, but uh, if you think about the LZ formula, LZ, the LZ formula is the the, the the expression that allows you to go from uh, correlation functions, green function theory to scattering algorithms. And LZ tells you that you should amputate your diagram. So only connect, fully connected, amputated uh, correlators contribute to scattering algorithms. And so if you follow LZ, if you amputate your external legs, then these contributions are not there. However, um, if you think about uh, they may come back in a, in a subtle way if you work in a renormalization scheme, which is not the onshot scheme. Um, so most of the times calculations are performed in QCD are performed in MS bar, the minimum subtraction scheme. And in MS bar, the LZ formula receives some, some corrections. In particular, the poles, the residue of the poles the propagator is not fixed to be one, but it receives some correction. And essentially, this correction corresponds to those diagrams with a factor of a half because it's the square root uh, of this, uh, this diagram. And so that's why you, you may, in MS bar, you actually have to compute those with, with a factor of a half. And so, however, um, all this discussion will be relevant if we were to do calculation with massive curves. Because in, ma in a massive theory in MS bar, all these integrals that I uh, are inside inside this uh, thin box actually to give you zero. Sorry, to make it more precise, these integrals, these are not integrals, but these integrals, they are zero because they are massless, they have no scale. So the only um, in, in, in MS bar um, with mass support they give you uh, zero. Now the the two uh, the, the counter terms at the bottom, they have ultraviolet poles, but they cancel when you add them together. <clears throat> so at the end of the day, also, you know, if you combine all these guys, they essentially, again, get zero. So at the end of the day, in a massless, if you're working with a massless theory and we're using MS bar, the only diagram that we really need to uh, worry about is this diagram here. And this diagram, we can treat this diagram as if already we have to form uh, the, the ultraviolet renormalization. Now, I think this is a little bit of a confused way, but at the end of the day, what we need to do is to calculate this diagram. Okay? 
and uh, okay, and we don't need to renormalize. Like the, the, the effect of the normalization, so the effect of the counter term, has already cancelled against the other uh, the other contribution. Okay, so let's uh, let's try and, and write down what we have to calculate. So we write down our. Uh, well, this depends a bit on your convention, let's say. One loop, and we're going to do this in D dimension. <coughs> okay. So let me write down the final diagram and some uh, P1, P2 is going out. This is Q. I'm going to call this K. Uh, the loop might flow this way. Okay, so what do I how how do, do I build a loop that? Well, there's a there's a loop integration because the, the momentum k is not fixed. And I have V bar P2, then I have QCD vertex minus I GS gamma rho. TA. Then I have the Fermi propagator I minus P2 plus K divided by P2 plus K squared plus I epsilon. Then I have the electroweak uh, coupling. Minus I G I'm going to write W to distinguish from this. So divided by two cross theta w. That's the same as in the uh, leading on case. And then goes to the... Um, then what do I have? Then I have, again, a Fermi propagator. Now the momentum is P1 slash minus K slash divided by P1 minus K. K squared plus I epsilon. Then I have the vertex minus I GS gamma sigma TV. And then finally, I have the um, gluon propagator, which at this order, it doesn't really it doesn't matter in which gauge we work. At this order. I'm just going to write this as G sigma divided by k squared plus i epsilon delta a b. I reminded that a and b are interestingly a joint percentage. And uh, to be precise, um, I'm, if I write these things in dimensional regularization, then let me call this coupling GS bar, because the gauge coupling in dimension uh, different than for will acquire some dimension. And then it's useful to sort of separate out the dimensionless coupling times the scale. Again, maybe this is a, well, it's a simple exercise, but you can try it. It's a side show. What I mean, I should show that the dimension in D dimension and dimension of the gauge coupling is uh, 4D minus, 4 minus D. Okay, let's do maybe uh, one more step. Sorry. Sure. Yeah, I think we are missing the fermion, right? In the amplitude, I mean, it's not that. We are fermion, missing the final fermion, correct. Thank you. Where shall we put it? So let's put it here. 
Thank you very much. And uh, if you want to also be very, uh, I guess that's, you can all, you know, if you want to be very pedant, not that you want to be pedantic. If I want to be very pedantic, then I can also add the uh, color indices for uh, the fundamental representation, right? So the V, V bar and the U will have color, like one color index, and the T will have two, two color indices. Thank you very much. Point things out, which I think I forgot everywhere in my questions. So good. Okay, so how can I write this uh, in a in a more compact way? Well, I can take out of the integral uh, all the all the things that do not depend on the on k. So I have i g w divided by two cos theta one. Gs square mu four minus d. Then I have ta ta. And here, if I want to put the not quite like that v bar p two ta. TA and DK D. And here I have P two square plus by epsilon D one plus K square plus I epsilon. Then, sorry, I also have k square plus i epsilon. And then here we'll have a numerator which depends on p1, p2, and k contracted with my epsilon star. Okay, so as an exercise, let's and let me write down the color indices. How do they go? Well, here there will be an I in blue. Uh, an I, I, K, K, J, and J. And I work out, I want to work out for you these uh, uh, color index, color factor here. One way of doing so. One way, I mean, one can compute it explicitly. Um, one way of, of interesting, which is actually quite, quite useful for more complicated, even more complicated color, color structure, is to use the fierce identities. And in particular, I like them in a, in a graphic representation. In the graphic representation, the fierce identities, they go like that. Okay, JM is equal to a half IJ KM minus one over NC IK J. Now, in our particular case, what we want to compute is TA I K T K J. Okay, so I take these expression here. And in order to obtain these, what I have to do is I have to identify 
k and m. And there's a nice graphical interpretation to do so. Then you see that if you identify k and l, which means you contracted the delta function k and l, you have i and j. And when you identify k and l, this comes as a, as a circle, minus one over and c. And you, here, if you identify k and l, you just k in a straight line. So here you have a half. You see, you have a straight line. A straight line is a delta function, j. And here, what you have, you have a, a closed circle. A closed circle is a is the dimensionality of, of the space we are integrating over. So that's n c minus one over n c. If you want a closed circle, tells you it's it's the trace of delta uh, i j, which is n c for s c. And so this is one over n c n c squared minus one delta i j. And this is a name, it's called the color factor CF. There's actually a very, very nice book that you can find online by uh, Svitanovich that deals, uh, that in, teaches you how to compute all this color factor using this graphical technique that uh, calls vertex. So it's very, very interesting. Okay, so the color factor of this diagram is famous to CF. Um, okay, so that was the part which was different compared to QED. Now, same as in, uh, uh, in QED, we have to compute the, the looping. Um, there are standard ways of doing that. Um, in particular, uh, what is usually done is that you use uh, you combine the denominators using what are known as the finite parameters, and once you've done so, then the, the, you have to vic rotate uh, to you clean the space, perform the integral, and integrate over the finite par parameter. Um, there is no surprise that the integral, if the resulting integral, uh, can be ultraviolet diversion. That's why you actually done the. Uh, the calculation in dimensional regularization. But there are actually another thing which may be, uh, may be well, they are worrisome for us. If we look at the integral that we have to perform, and if we look in particular at the denominator, let me write it here for you. Uh, if you look at the denominator of the integral we want to do, as this form. There's a k square plus i epsilon. And if I uh, explicitly do this, these squares, p1 squared is zero. So I have minus two p1 dot k plus k squared plus i epsilon. And then I have two p2 dot k plus k squared plus i epsilon. So you see that I have singularities in two cases. So if I have momenta, if I'm integrating over a region of the loop momenta, which is soft, so it's much smaller than the pi mean, then k square has to be, is, is also going to be very small. And I encounter, and this is a singular region for this integral. So, the integral I have to compute exhibits soft singularities. Not only that, if k mu is collinear, becomes collinear to either p1 or p2, that means there is a constant ai times pi mu. Also in this region, singularity is a p. Because k squared also is going to be small, but also p2 dot k of p1 to k becomes small. Yeah. 
And so also in, in, in this region, you have singularities. For instance, your integral, once you it rotated. As this uh, form. This is uh, integral e minus one. And if I say that d is four minus epsilon dimension, is integral. Now, you see, as now there's the subtle point. So I want to use dimensional regularization to regulate this integral in the infrared. So in the region where L e square is small, L e goes to zero. So if I want to regularize the integral in the infrared, then I need to require epsilon to be uh, less than zero. However, I was using dimensional regularization to regulate integrals in the UV. And in that case, I had to require epsilon bigger than zero to regulate the ultraviolet singularities. So here, an inconsistency seemed to appear because I you know, I, 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 I worked out my integral using dimensional regularization, but now I really have to think about epsilon having being positive or negative if I want to regulate things in the ultraviolet or in the infrared. What is usually done is that one close their eyes and, and continues and, and essentially states that um, the, the sign of epsilon will be uh, the correct one to regulate the singularity view. In some sense, we are dealing with the analytic continuation of those integrals, and so we, um, we kind of ignore the sign of epsilon. But one interesting thing appears. I told you uh, about 20 minutes ago that there, there were some integrals which give me zero in dimensional regularization. And actually, these zero, um, these are divergent integrals where the ultraviolet poles normal epsilon cancel against the infrared poles to give you zero. But this zero is really uh, uh, coming, coming about because you're canceling to it. And the same way happens for the, the integral that we, we are performing now. The integral, this loop integral we are performing is divergent in, in the ultraviolet, but that divergence in ultraviolet is canceled by a singularity in, by one of our absolute point in infrared. And so at the end of the day, the integral we are calculating has no ultraviolet singularities, although it still has infrared singularities. Right? Okay. So now comes the, the real question. We do the integral and we find that the integral as a series of poles, in particular as a one over epsilon square pole and a one over epsilon pole. And uh, we argue that these poles are soft uh, infrared poles. Now, we scratch our heads because we don't know what to do with those. If they were ultraviolet poles, we could renormalize the theory to get rid of them. But these are infrared poles, so we don't know uh, how to do it. Um, this was mentioned yesterday. So, there are essentially two types of approach. Uh, let me call it the first one, although I don't like the names, but I couldn't come up with something better. The theory inspired one. So theory inspired way of dealing with uh, ultra infrared singularities. Well, why do they arise? Well, they arise because the um, QED QCD in the same way QED um, is mediated by masses patterns. And these masses patterns have, have a long range, uh, a long range interaction. 
And what's going wrong is the fact that when we build our LS matrix, we assume that our in and out states are free states. Why rather, they should be coherent states. So they should be dressed electrons or dressed quarks and gluons um, that sort of essentially absorb these this singularities. This is the approach, and this, Sasha mentioned this paper yesterday, which is beautifully described in a, in a paper by Fadir and Kulish and many others. And so you really, if you want to define a finite test matrix, then you need to account for the fact that your asymptotic states are not free states. But this long range interaction survive this limit. And so you can't talk about free particles, uh, even if they are infinite zero. That's a very that's the most compelling way of dealing with that. Unfortunately, is that is the one that it's been more complicated to actually apply. And so more often than not, what people are using is a more, let me call it theme inspired, although I mean it's uh, is equally sound. It's not, it's not the rubbish. And the theme is probably one, which is one we're going to use, is to give up talking about S matrix sum, we're getting on, and we talk about cross section. And in particular, we talk about inclusive cross section. And in doing so, we hope to cancel uh, these singularities. Why do I say so? Well, if we talk about cross section, at order alpha, then we really have to write down all possible diagrams that contribute to cross-section inclusively. That means that we not only have to include the virtual corrections, but also real emission diagrams. So in particular, so far, we've only included those two diagrams. But if we want to talk about inclusive cross-section, we have to do two things. So first of all, we have, we'll have to square uh, these amplitudes, but also include this cross section means that we need also to include those diagrams. Because it's fine inclusive of the final state, then producing a Z boson or a Z boson plus a gluon or plus anything else. It should count, you know, it's, a, it's part of, of my, my measurement. And so if I really expand this, what I find is that I have this diagram, I have the interference between the loop diagram and the boron, and then also I have the real radiation diagram. Plus all the alpha s square. What is the, the subtle point? Is that you may say, well, the real addition diagrams describe different final states. So why should I include them? Well, let's notice that you know, we are worried about something that happens in the region where blooms are soft or collinear. Now, if you take a real emission diagram, you take the limit in which the gluon is very soft, then the kinematics of this diagram will look precisely the same as the kinematic of the leading order or the kinematic of the loop diagram. In other way, if a gluon is very soft, then there's no way we can detect it. That's why we talk about cross-section measurable quantities. And so um, you know, there's hope that this kinematic configuration can cure uh, the singularity that we've seen in the loop diagram. Same holds for the community. If the gluon is, is emitted along the line of the quark, then we cannot resolve it. And so the, this diagram has, in that limit has the same kinematics as the loop diagram. And so there is hope that the two things can cancel. Okay, so if we 
push this uh, cross-section approach, then we have to compute two things. We have to compute the twice the real part of the interference between the loop diagram and the ball. And if we do so, this is called the uh, virtual contribution. What do we find? If we take the limit epsilon to zero of twice the real part of m one loop star four minus epsilon m zero four minus epsilon, what do I get? Well, I get the linear order contribution in four dimension. Two alpha s by the so the prefactors are not crucial. CF, this we write it down because we completed mu square q square to the power epsilon and a half, a bunch of constants. Unimportant. What is important is the pole structure. I have a one over epsilon square plus three quarters. One over epsilon plus things which are finite in epsilon. And these poles are purely infrared poles. Again, notice that the kinematics is the same of leading all the kinematics. So S hat is equal to Q squared, or if you want, tau hat is equal to one. So there's a delta function of one. Tau hat, I remind you, is tau divided by z1 z2. What about the real contribution? Well, we have to take these two diagrams, sum them and square them. And then we have to integrate them over the phase space of the real gluon. We do this integral in d dimension. Um, and remember that now k squared is equal to zero because now in the case of the real emission, this guy is uh, uh, it, the gluon is on channel. Now, what is different in these emission diagrams? Well, the kinematics now is more complicated because now I have the p1 plus p2 is equal to q plus k. So S hat, which is equal to P1 plus P2 square, is equal to K plus Q square. So is K square, which is zero, two K dot Q plus Q square. Tau hat, which is Q square over S hat, is one minus two k dot q over s hat. You see now the tau hat is not, it's less than one. However, when k becomes small or collinear, then tau hat again goes to So let me write down the result for you of the real emission diagram. Same prefactor as before. And then I have a one over epsilon square with a coefficient which is a delta function, one minus tau hat. 
I have three quarters, one over epsilon with a coefficient, which is again, one minus a hat. And that's very good because it's the same, same structure as before with the opposite sign. So indeed the one over epsilon pole, the one over epsilon square pole is canceled and the three quarters one, one over epsilon pole is indeed canceled when I add the two. However, here I also have another singularity multiply by a function of tau hat. And then I have a finite part. Is PQQ of Z oh, sorry, divided by CF because PQQ of Z is CF so this DQQ bar doesn't have any one over epsilon pole, but it's in general distribution. So it contains plus distribution. So um, to conclude what we've seen today is that now we, we can add the two things together. And we see that all the poles in the virtual corrections, the inferior poles in the inferior correction, are canceled when we sum the real emission. And that is an example of the famous theorem, which is called the Kinoshita Linoibe theorem, uh, which we'll discuss a bit more in detail tomorrow. And if we were to do QCD radiation only in the final state, let's say plus and minus into hadrons, this would be the whole story. We will have a complete cancellation between the infrared poles of the loop diagram and the infrared poles that you get when you integrate the real emission of them. Here, however, we have something a little bit more disturbing, slow to solve, which is the fact that the real emission diagrams introduce yet another one of the epsilon singularity of uh, infrared origin, and in particular of collinear origin, so a one of the epsilon pole the residue of which is not a delta function. And so there is no way it can cancel against the virtual correction, which are a delta function in one minus tau hat. And so, um, you know, on one hand, we are, we are happy because we seem to cancel the, uh, the infrared singularity. Actually, all the soft singularity do cancel. All the infrared singularity, soft and green, will cancel if we add final separation. But because we're starting with the proton, the two protons actually, we have a one over epsilon pole of collinear origin, which is not canceled yet. And that's the final thing we'll have to work on, we'll do this tomorrow, to make a finite prediction at order alpha s for our Dorian cross section. Okay? So I think this is a, a good point to, to stop. And uh, we'll. Uh, oh. I am I'm sure that I went a bit fast in some points and definitely wasn't clear. So happy to try and answer uh, all your questions, uh, all the questions that you may have in the discussion. And we'll continue. Uh, we'll try to find out what, what we're going to do with this one of our absolute poll um, tomorrow morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So thank you, Simone, for the lecture. Are there are questions. All right, I'll I'll have have a question. Please go on. Yeah. Uh, it's probably something stupid, but when you're including the soft gluons, why do you not care about the the charges that they'll have? Because you're kind of like forgetting about charge conservation, like the color that they carry. So, like, uh... Uh, okay, let me, so you mean? I mean, when, so when you have an infrared photon, uh, like a soft photon and you include it to, you know, the Bram Stralung so that you can get rid of all of the infrared divergences that way, it's fine because it's a chargeless object, but I don't really see 
like because the gluons all carry a color <laughs> why, why can you include them um that's uh that if you want that is that is the most difficult question uh uh, that one can ask. Uh, at this point, um, uh, I think it's okay. Well, it's okay because we, we're taking the opposite route, if you want. So we, we started from the full diagram, the full loop diagram. And the full loop diagram has all the color which is treated in the correct way. Okay, so I'm not doing any approximation by this fact. And indeed, I've computed uh, the full color factor here. Okay. And, uh, and I've been careful like to keep it in between the V bar and the U, because as you say, you know, I can't move things around with the gluons carry color. Um, now the, the so at this point, I just, you know, I that, that's what happens. Uh, now one can ask, can I um, can I write down my amplitude in a factorized way? And I guess this is what you're after. So in GED, there's a very elegant way, uh, very elegant argument that allows you to essentially write down, write down the amplitude for the emission, not one or two, but as many soft photons as you want. That's called the icon approximation. And, and now in QCD, there is something similar, but um, color plays a crucial role. And, uh, and, and what you get is something which is not a fully factorized form. Now, we will discuss this um, tomorrow um, because tomorrow we'll take the opposite point of view that meaning that we want to factorize things first. Here, we, we took a more like, a, you know, I'll do the whole calculation and see what happened kind of approach. So I treat color in, in full way. I, 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 I do my integrals, I get a pole, and the pole counts. But in some sense, I've, I haven't learned much. Uh, uh, what we'll do tomorrow in the second part of the lecture is to sort of like reverse engineer that and say, okay, can I see the structure? Can I understand the structure of the singularity? And in, in, in doing so, we'll come across precisely to the, the question that you're raising. Actually, I should say more. By preparing this lecture, I noticed that in, in our book on jets, this thing is done in the wrong way. So we'll correct it precisely for the reason you said. So <laughs> that we were not careful, we were not careful about color. Okay, thank you very much. You're right.